Hello, my name is Caroline Buckenstein. I'm a history major here at Goucher College. Today I'm going to explore the relationship between medicine, public health, and alienation. As a child, I grew up around the hospital where my mom worked. I was always curious and fascinated with the magic of modern medicine. This changed when several years ago, I became very sick and was hospitalized. My own illness has left doctors confused and without answers. I had doctors laugh at me and ignore my illness. It took years, but I was diagnosed with a rare genetic condition. On my journey to receive this diagnosis, I found myself questioning the origins of medicine in the United States. How did doctors, hospitals, and medicine develop into respected sources of authority? Why have some areas of medicine grown quickly while others still lack answers? Specifically, I questioned the ways that medicine and public health throughout history has helped some while alienating others based on things like race, sex, or socioeconomic background. As I started to explore disease outbreaks and medical advancements, I discovered instances when the people in need of medical attention were the ones being ostracized and treated like the enemy. Questioning these things led me to the plague outbreak of 1900 in San Francisco's Chinatown. People had begun moving to the United States from China during the mid-19th century. They had moved for a number of reasons, like to work as laborers on the railroad or through the possibility of wealth from the gold rush. Eventually, many of these immigrants settled in cities within communities that became Chinatowns. As the Chinese community grew in the United States, the image of Asian people as unclean and unfit for citizenship dominated throughout society. It was the viewpoint that contributed to the 1882 Exclusion Act. Through looking at primary and secondary sources, my research explores how public health officials use pub public health policies to blame Asian immigrants in San Francisco's Chinatown for the plague outbreak of 1900. Analyzing the plague outbreak of 1900 shows the shifting roles, medical knowledge, pre-existing stereotypes, and failing infrastructure played in the biased decisions of public health officials. Pre-existing stereotypes also led public health officials to misdirect their concerns towards ports, cracking down on incoming immigrants rather than focusing on the spread of disease among long-established Chinatown residents. At the end of the 1800s, a paradigm shift was happening in medicine. The pre-existing miasma theory was being replaced by an understanding of bacteria. The image on the left is a depiction of miasma theory. The idea that bad air was the cause of disease. While the photo on the right depicts a rat traveling in a ship coming into port, the theory of bacteriology demonstrated how disease was spread through microscopic organisms that were carried by vectors. In the case of plague, it was transmitted through fleas, which were carried by rats. Although this new knowledge existed, it would be years before it would become accepted by the medical community. This meant that medical and public health measures were inconsistent and sometimes based on miasma theory, even though it had been disproven. These inconsistencies had a significant impact on the decisions of the California Board of Health, which had just been founded in 1869. These inconsistencies led to disagreements among officials about how to diagnose disease and handle it. The newly founded Board of Health struggled with establishing itself and lack of funding. They had inherited all of the issues of San Francisco, mainly the failing infrastructure like water and waste disposal. This meant that residents of San Francisco began blaming public health officials for these issues. Faced with this pressure, public health officials began targeting Chinese herbalists, prohibiting them from practicing. Due to the gruesome methods of Western medicine at the time, a variety of people went to Chinese herbalists. Instead, public health officials tried to force people to seek out Western style doctors. This just backfired, creating more distrust to public health officials within the Chinese community. It also meant that residents of Chinatown did not seek out any medical care at all. At this time, the California Board of Health became concerned about what their annual report called the Chinese question. In order to learn more about living, people living in Chinatown, they began unofficial inspections led by untrained volunteers, which revealed unhygienic conditions. Because these inspections began, there was already a pre-existing stigma about Chinese immigrants as disease-carrying immoral people that posed a threat to society. This is the same stigma that played a role in the 1882 Exclusion Act. This act also limited the ability of Asian immigrants already in the United States from gaining citizenship. Through these inspections, public health officials found what they believed to be proof to support their stereotypes, gambling, prostitution, and opium dens. Public health officials believed that these unhygienic conditions were an indication of the morality of the Chinese residents of San Francisco Chinatown. These forced inspections of homes, businesses, worsened the distrust of public health officials. Due to a recent plague outbreak in Honolulu, which led to Chinatown being destroyed by a fire, many Chinese residents 
and San Francisco were already fearful of public health officials. Since public health officials believed the unhygienic status of Chinatown was a result of immoral choices, they ignored the failing infrastructure. This also turned the discussion away from understanding how disease was transmitted, focusing rather on morality as the culprit. The Biennial Report of 1870-1871 discussed the concern for proper ventilation needs in San Francisco's hospitals and in California public schools. Although the, public, the Board of Public Health recognized that the need for correcting ventilation and other issues, within Chinatown, these issues were seen to be the fault of the residents. The residents of Chinatown also faced issues with overcrowding, waste disposal, and proper sewage systems. Chinese residents of Chinatown were mostly tenants. The places they lived and worked were owned by white upper middle class residents of San Francisco. Although the Chinese residents did not own the properties, they were still seen as responsible for these structural issues, while their landlords refused to modify the properties. These pre-existing stereotypes about Chinese immigrants turned them into what Michel Foucault calls the social enemy. Foucault's concept of the social enemy consists of people seen as being outside of society, although they may live geographically within that area. These social enemies are considered to be a threat to the bulk of society, which means they need to be dealt with in ways like assimilation or isolation. Looking at the actions of public health officials demonstrates how Chinese residents were seen as outsiders, social enemies, and how when they refuse to assimilate, they're forced into isolation through quarantine. In March of 1900, an Asian man was found dead in a Chinatown hotel due to some type of disease that the Board of Public Health suspected was plague. This led to a string of decisions by public health officials. Although it was discovered that the man who had died was a resident of San Francisco for 16 years, the concerns of officials turned towards the ports and immigration. Controlling immigration in the ports was also prioritized because of any, any rumors of disease could shut down trade and negatively impact the economy. Immediately, the Board of Health quarantined Chinatown, ordering all whites to be removed, allowing only white people to be allowed to enter and exit. The focus was on impressing politicians in the press rather than for the health of Chinatown's residents. Other measures included requiring Chinese people to clean up the premises. They then required any Chinese deaths to be confirmed by a Caucasian physician in order for a burial permit to be obtained. This continued to worsen already existing distrust of the Board of Public Health. At this time, there are many questions about how reliable bacteriological evidence was to support the need to try and quarantine based on race. Connecting race and disease in this way was consistent with public health official stigmas. These ideas were not shared among all white San Franciscans or within the Chinese community itself. Representatives from Chinatown sought to communicate with public health officials and also took legal action against these biased policies. There were lawsuits by the Chinese community to contest these policies. Eventually, contra Controversy over shifting medical knowledge and other concerns like that of trade led to the lifting of the quarantine. Many concerns over a plague outbreak led to attempts at house-to-house -house forced inoculations, further cordons, inspections, and limiting travel of Chinese people. Some Chinese residents allowed themselves to be inoculated in order to be permitted to travel. By the end of May, some had become very sick due to the inoculations and the government started making claims that Inoculation was not required, but instead just suggested. As seen in the image on the left, Chinese people are forcing inoculations on the public health officials as the court watches. The inoculations are depicted making the public health officials sick and harming them, which is the way the Chinese community experienced these forced inoculations. Due to the rampant distrust of public health officials and the underdeveloped inoculations, many Chinatown residents believe the intent of these inoculations was to harm people. A lawsuit was also filed at this time, claiming that the government was unjustly prohibiting Chinese residents from traveling. And then on May 28th, a judge decided that the forced inspections, inoculations, and trying to limit travel must stop. In response, public health officials had the Board of Supervisors to approve quarantine and travel restrictions, again on May 29th. This back and forth continued until a judge ruled these actions racially discriminatory. Since the Board of Public Health was a newer department, it was unclear the limits and reaches of its authority. When first established, the Board of Health claimed that so long as the state acts cautiously and on well-assured scientific grounds, there is no danger but that the observance of our sanitary rules will be voluntary and not compulsory. 
Although they established these guidelines, inoculations given were not effective and were hazardous to people. The rules forced on Chinatown were not optional or voluntary. Further guidelines do establish that, quote, there may be cases, however, in which it will become necessary to compel obedience to the rules of hygiene, end quote. These guidelines are vague and do not establish what specific elements decide when it is necessary to use force. Without well-established scientific knowledge at this time and vague guidelines allowing for public health officials to act based on their own biases. This force on blaming, this focus on blaming Chinese continued into the November of 1900. Throughout the 1900 out plague outbreak, public health officials also used some less focused upon measures like killing rats and fumigating the sewage systems. At this time, it was known that rats commonly carried and spread plague but that was not the main focus of public health tactics. Rather, stereotypes about Chinese and all Asian people guided decision-making. There were misdiagnosed cases of plague by white physicians, which seemed to escalate fear of the outbreak by making case numbers seem higher, validating their discriminatory decisions. The concern over the threat of plague on trade and the economy was so central that the Board of Public Health did not officially announce the outbreak until May 21st, even though the first person died on March 8th. Plague remained present in San Francisco through 1908, with cases in places outside of Chinatown. The focus by these later outbreaks shifted among some towards attacking the true transmitters of plague rats. The perception of disease shifted as medical knowledge and understanding became disseminated throughout society. Even with this knowledge, future public health decisions still targeted the Chinese community. Public health officials tried to leave Chinatown out of updates to sewage infrastructure in 1903. These updates were finally completed after the 1906 earthquake presented the opportunity to update a lot of the infrastructure across all of California. There were still many ways the Chinese community was alienated and seen in it as separate from the rest of society. The 1900 plague outbreak gave the Chinese community a chance to fight for justice and autonomy. The racialization of disease continued to target Chinese in Chinatown, seeing them as social enemies and in need of regulation or isolation for generations to come. The image of the social enemy targeting the marginalized and minorities is present across time. It can be seen in the case of Mary Malone, known as Typhoid Mary, who was quarantined on an island off of New York indefinitely because she was a carrier of typhoid. This alienation is also seen in the treatment of the gay community at the peak of the HIV AIDS epidemic. The targeting of the Asian community has continued into the present as the world faces the COVID-19 pandemic, assuming all Asian people are innately diseased. In future research, I'd be interested to see how further advancements in scientific and medical knowledge impact this targeting of certain communities. How does public health measures operate to alienate groups of people across time periods? Looking at the plague outbreak in San Francisco in 1900 and other plague outbreaks across history, what similarities and differences are present, present in the functioning of public health institutions? How do these historical moments provide insight and connections to our present global pandemic and public health response? The experience of San Francisco's Chinatown residents demonstrates how public health and medical institutions can shape and influence societal perspectives of groups of people in ways that further alienate them from society.